Hey, welcome to Straight Painting. I'm your host, Zach, and on this week's episode, we're going to take a look at the work of Emily Carr. Emily Carr was born in 1871 in Victoria, British Columbia, the very same year that British Columbia joined the nation of Canada. She grew up in a very English household, with both her parents being English immigrants. Her father encouraged Carr's art explorations, but it was not until 1890, following the death of both her parents, that she began studying at the San Francisco Art Institute. She continued her studies on and off throughout her life, and in 1910 she went to France, where she was influenced by the Fauves, and developed the style that we know her by. Another hallmark of Carr's work was the inclusion of indigenous artwork and cultural items in her paintings. In 1898, when she was 27, Carr took her first sketching trip to the indigenous communities in the coastal BC area, which became a huge influence on, and the subject of, her most well-known pictures. This has also become a subject of debate about whether her inclusion of First Nations woodworking in her landscapes amounts to cultural appropriation. If you'd like to learn more about her life, or views on her work, I'd suggest the Group of Seven website, even though she was not a member of the group, the Canadian art article, The Trouble with Emily Carr, the Prentice Pieces article, When Cultural Appropriation is Forgiven, and the TVO doc short film, Emily Carr, Church in Uquat Village, which I'll leave links to below. Unlike the group of seven who sought to paint the Canadian landscape as a pristine, uninhabited terra nullius, devoid of any signs of indigenous peoples, Carr painted the, la painted the landscapes that she visited as she saw them. Traveling the coast of BC, she would often be found on horseback, and with a dog and pet monkey as companions. Carr was welcomed by the various indigenous nations that she visited, and spent time living among on her sketching trips. The new Chinolth people even gave her the name Klee Wick, which means laughing one. Her depictions of the land as she saw it included indigenous totems and other artworks, like this one, Big Raven. However, her inclusion of these works is often in a way that seems to depict a vanished indigenous presence. In Big Raven, we find a totem of a raven, which is traditionally incorporated into the life of a village, placed alone in the wilderness. The dark clouds above, in bringing in stormy weather, and the very ground the totem stands on twisting around it, as if to swallow it into the land itself. Is this a statement on the effects of policies like the potlatch ban that saw the removal of totem poles and other cultural items from their communities to be dispersed around the world to museums and collectors, as well as the banning of cultural ceremonies? Or is the missing presence of people who carve the totem a comment on the fact that they've already vanished? I can't say, but those questions stay with you. In Church at Uquat Village, which was renamed from Indian Church in 2018, we find a missionary church in Uquat on the Pacific coast of Vancouver Island. The white church stands in the center of the frame with a forest blocking out any view of the sky. There's a lack of depth to the piece caused by the forest which presses in and towers over the steeple from behind. The church itself is windowless and devoid of any sign of human life, outside of the graveyard on each side. Could Carr have been making a statement on the role of missionary work in destroying the cultural practices of the nations that she visited with this piece? To me, these images of indigenous communities feel slightly uneasy because there are no people present in them. And that brings me to the idea of Carr's cultural appropriations. Coming into this video, I expected to find that Carr was not widely regarded or respected in the indigenous communities whose cultural items she depicted in her work. I was not prepared to find that she is so well thought of in those communities to this day. There's no question of whether she appropriated, but whether it was done in a way that was harmful. The consensus of what I've found is that she did it in a way that is not viewed as being harmful because of how she engaged with the community she was depicting. She was a painter who was using her vibrant and lively style to communicate what she was seeing as she lived in and among indigenous communities, during a time when extreme cultural superiority was the norm. The fact that she engaged with the indigenous nations around her, and gave something back for the inspirations she received, is related to the idea of reconciliation and forming bonds of community with indigenous nations. I would tell any artist starting out their career today to not borrow indigenous imagery for their work like Carr did, but her methods of creating community and engaging in that process are something I would recommend to anyone interested in reconciliation. The Group of Seven's work involved the erasure of indigenous peoples from their landscapes, 
while Carr attempted to include their totems and other objects in her landscapes, though both still have the result of a missing indigeneity to their works. One artist who has been working to introduce indigeneity to these paintings is Sunny Asu, an artist from the Kwakwakawak Nation, who has remade a series of Carr's works that include West Coast form lines, S-shapes, U-shapes, and ovoids. The introduction of these forms asserts the indigenous presence that is supposed to be there, but isn't shown. He flips the idea that Carr was capturing the indigenous decline with the idea that she was instead capturing the settler's decline, in a way that offers a good dose of sci-fi feeling. I'll leave a link in the description box below if you want to check out more works from his series, Interventions on the Imaginary. In the late 1930s, Carr's paintings changed to focus on different aspects of the landscape around her, after Lauren Harris had encouraged her to leave behind her indigenous inspirations. This led to her style changing and starting to emphasize the use of lines over form. There is also a kaleidoscope-like effect caused by all of these swirling lines and the fact that the horizon lines are rarely, if ever, flat. In Above the Gravel Pit, we find an open pit dug into the ground with a line of trees that undulates to match the swirling sky above it and causes this feeling of viewing the world at the beginning of a carnival ride as you are forced into motion against your will. In Upward Trend, we find ourselves at a sand beach on the shoreline, with the sky in front of us appearing to be lost in a haze that rises up into the sky. The ground in the center seems to be buckling below us, making us feel like we are suspended in air for a moment, like Wiley e. Coyote, before we look down and realize we will begin to fall too. In Strait of Juan de Fuca, part of a series sharing that same name, we find ourselves in the most stable feeling of all of these paintings. The shore is home to pieces of driftwood and sand, and off in the distance across the Salish Sea, we see a hint of land on the horizon, before the clouds draw us up and out of the frame. I chose this piece after finding it at the Musée de Beaux-Arts de Montréal, because it was the first from this period of Carr's work that I had come across. I really like the expressive brushwork on display, and the bright yet desaturated palette that Carr used. And those will be my two focal points for this episode. And how did we do? All right, we've got our finished card here, so as always, we'll do a little review before we put some top coat on it and place it into the deck. So the two goals that we had coming to this project were to focus on the expressive brushwork of the original, as well as to maintain the color palette of the original. I think in terms of palette, um, I've done a pretty good job here. I've got a lot of the different blues that she used, uh, as well as some of the board coloring and the tan of the shoreline. Uh, however, it's not as much as it could be, and the reason for that is that I ended up aggressively cropping this image to the right-hand side to focus more on that original, that main goal of the expressive brushwork that she was using. Um, and in terms of that, how I think we did is it's a mixed bag. Uh, I think the top section of the clouds here turned out really well. You get a sense of that upward thrust uh, and the energy of, of those clouds pulling you up and out of the picture here. Uh, but in terms of on the water itself, it didn't turn out as well. And the reason for that is I just got carried away while doing my, my dry brushing work and I didn't make sure that my brush was as dry as it could be before I started making these streaks. And so I ended up getting a lot more cloudiness uh, and a lot more paint than I wanted to on the bottom. Uh, however, it's no big deal because, you know, now I know how to dry brush better. So that's a, a win for me. Um, yeah, so I think this card's ready to go. Uh, I would be happy to see it in my, in my hand uh, simply because of how nice the colors are for the palette, um, even if the brushwork is a bit of a letdown in some spots. All right, now that we've got our finished card, it's time for our final takeaway as always, which is to remember that the effort you put in is more important than the perfection you achieve. And that's to say, the more you try, the better you'll get. You just have to try. I want to thank you as always for joining me. Um, I had a lot of fun learning more about the work of Emily Carr. Uh, as I said earlier, I wasn't familiar with a lot of the, you know, views of her work or the reception that it had. So it was really interesting for me to learn more about that. And I hope that you learned something as well in this process as well. Normally, this is also where I would tell you that I'll see you in two weeks time with another project. But 
This has been the 10th Canadian artist that I've covered so far in this series, and that represents a third of the overall islands for the deck that I've been making. I have 20 more slots left to go, and I've decided that I'm going to take a little break uh, just to think about where I've come so far in this project and what I'd like to do with those final remaining 20 slots. So I won't see you in two weeks' time, but I will see you soon with a new episode, and we'll start uh, working on the next third of, this, of the islands for this deck. Until then, I wish you happy painting and peace.